Sapphire to Franklin is described as an individual with a variety of abilities. He has wide experience at both the national and regional levels in dealing with marine security and related issues. His background includes a well-grounded experience, training and education as a naval officer from a successful military career spanning 32 years and 10 months. Significant landmarks. Command of the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard in 1993. Overall command of the Defense Force in 1999 as Chief of Defense Staff being the first individual to join the Defense Force as a cadet and climbed the ladder to the highest. He developed a well-rounded academic background during his service, life at the undergraduate and graduate levels, on his degree from University of Wales in Maritime Geography, a Master of Science degree in Marine Affairs, Management from Dalhousie University in Canada, and a Diploma in International Human Humanitarian Law from the International Institute of International Human Humanitarian Law in Italy. He is currently involved in academic activity as a director of the Institute of Marine Affairs and a member of staff of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Commodore Franklin is the holder of the following awards. The Hummingbird Medal, Gold, the Efficiency Medal, 1980, the Efficiency Decoration, 1986, Past Staff Course, 1987, the Admiral Ryan Medal from the Venezuelan Armed Forces, 1991, the Naval Medal of Honor from the Venezuelan Navy, 2002, General Service Medal for Action in 1990-2002, Caricom Youth Medal from the TNT Cadet Force, 2006, the Golden Pulley from the TNT Scout Association in 2007. It goes on and on and on. He's a very tall man indeed in stature and in what he has done. I welcome to the podium Commodore Anthony Stafford Franklin. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> First, let me, I'm not sure whether I want to thank the Military Museum for inviting me here tonight. I mean, when I got a call, I, I asked Linda, well, why? And um, she said, Gaylord said. That was good enough for me. Uh, tonight, I hope to be able to contribute a bit to the Military History Week by perhaps giving you little smatterings of history to my story as a military officer in the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force. Last night I was here when Justice Cross gave his story and I asked um, Gaylord whether we could have postponed mine for about a week so that his effect could wear off. But they said no. Um, I have no war stories to give. Maybe I have a few um, as I told you, on sports pages, but we leave that for when the boys get together. Right, you know? Um, you know, it, it is interesting that this is the very first time I will be talking about my career as a military person since I, I left the Defense Force. The first time I was ever asked to talk about it. So, as with a little bit of trepidation, I mean, I don't really know what to say. I, I, I said, my story is not spectacular. Just that, um, as, as a young man, I got into the force. But perhaps the way how I got into the force might be a little bit um, strange. And you would see that as I speak on, some Strange things have happened to me during my time. I was born in Gonzales. People know where Gonzales is? All right. I grew up in, sorry, I, was, I grew up in Gonzales. I was really born in St. James. But I grew up in Gonzales. I went to Eastern Boys Government School, Market School. 
and I don't think many people know about that. Eastern Boys Government School was on Nelson Street, behind the market. My mother made sure that I, I got to school and took my lunch in Carrier. I don't think young know, people around here know what a Carrier is, a three-stage Carrier, right? And um, I had to carry my lunch and give it to a lady called Miss Green, who sold greens in the market. And every lunchtime, I would have to go and sit on a stool by Miss Green and eat my lunch because that's the only way my mother would ensure that I had my lunch. So between these two people, they ensured that I had sustenance and I left, I collected my car in the evening and went back home. Well, <clears throat> Gonzales is not a very wealthy place. At that time, it was a very uh, a quiet place nestling on the eastern side of Laventil and on the other side is um, Bella Road and so on. And there were a few of us who walked all the way down to Nelson Street to go to school. Some of us belonged to a school, right? That was just two buildings away from me in our whole study. But the thing is, as we grew to teenagers, we formed a club called Hill Toppers. And um, all the boys there, the parents, knew each other. So we were always under the constant gaze of parents. They encouraged us to do all sorts of things, play sports. The party was in my house. Dutch party, of course, in those days, you know, you didn't have money, so you bring your bottle of side drugs and so on and so on. But we all got something. We got ambition. We got values. So I was fortunate enough, I attended Eastern, Eastern Boys Government School and I was fortunate enough to win a government exhibition. I went to St. Mary's College. And last night when Justice Cross spoke about, I don't know how many of you were last night, he spoke about the languages. And I smiled and said, there's something in common here. Because like him, I did French, Latin, Spanish, and Greek. I don't think I made much use of it, the Latin and the Greek, but it certainly, afterwards, but it certainly helped me understand the English language a lot better. My science subject was biology, and this is what I offered for cadetship when I joined the Coast Guard. Strange thing number one. Boiled down to two of us, to be, for which one cadetship was being offered and the selection was between two of us, I was selected. So what did I do next time around? I married the sister of the guy who was number two. <laughs> um, so that started my life. But why did I get into the Coast Guard? I can't really tell you that I had a driving passion, but there was something. Because I can recall as a 15-year-old, 16-year-old, 17-year-old, 18-year-old, jumping on my bicycle, riding from Gonzales, stop in the market, and I would buy a bag of mangoes, ride down to St. Vincent Street Jetty, and sit on the NH Jetty most of the day and watch boats come in, in and out, in and out. I didn't know what I was learning, but I was learning something. Um, I used to hear, you know, the ringing of the, when the, I didn't know what it was, but I would hear, ting, 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 after I see water kick up and so on. And after a while I realized, all right, it, three things and the boat will start to go backwards and so on. And see, in those days, they used to have this um, telegraph system where the captain would ring from the bridge and the engineers would answer the command. And I would observe the vessels and move them. It turns out that I was learning something very important because 
when I eventually joined the Coast Guard and I went to England and we had to do, um, we had to pass, you had to get your tickets, you see, um, you had to learn to handle vessels and started you off with an outboard and you graduated up, there was something called a kitchen rudder, which I wouldn't know how to explain to you, then the twin screws, sailing boats and so on. Little did I know that what I was learning back when I was 16, 17, 18 was ship dynamics. I learned how a ship operated, moved, how the current moved it, how the wind affected it, how the, the action of the propellers affected the vessel, not only making it go ahead, but how, how much it was put to the side, and so on. Well, all these things have become extremely valuable to me, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So, I left school, I went to um, do my last level exam, so the time in my back pocket, so mom, see you later, and sat my last exam and I walked down to the Red House, walked into service commission, saw a guy whom I knew, I just did my last exam, he said, oh, so you're looking for a job, so I sit down. And an hour later, I had a letter to walk down to the Treasury. I started to work. About two months after that, <clears throat> I saw my classmate from St. Mary's College sat next to each other. His name is Michael Tony, and I don't know if you all know the company, um, Mark Castillo and Tony, and it's now Panel to Foster. He said, hey, Anthony, what are you doing? You want to do accounts? He said, sure. In a week time, I was at Cannons as a trainee accountant. I started doing my ACCA. We used to play cards at lunchtime. Clear the desk. This is up at Cannons in Stratton Lodge. And we play all fours. One day a magazine came across my desk. And I was browsing through this magazine and fellas calling me to you know, get in the floor and so on, and I am concentrating on this magazine. What caught my attention was a full page, a full spread, center spread picture of a set of white boys in a white t-shirt and long white pants and white shirt, all on the mast of a vessel on the yard, but I didn't know what it was. It's called a yard arm and they formed this, they had this formation, and I was reading this thing. And I turned to the fellas and said, boy, I would like to be there. Well, a month and a half later, I was there. It happened that um, I, I put down the magazine, but this thing stuck in me, and I was walking home one night. I used to play cricket, and I was playing for Paragon, and uh, going home one night after practice, government broadcasting, 10 o'clock in the night said, as I was walking up in the barricarium, so the people with the radios on loud, um, government offering a cadet ship in the Coast Guard. And apparently it was going on for quite a while, but I probably heard it for the last two days. And I went to my, told my mother, um, I heard about a cadet ship in the Coast Guard. She watched me and she started to cry. <coughs> you see, when I was about 16 years old, my godmother, who lived in the States, wanted to take me up to the States. She had no children. I was a cadet. I was in the Trinidad Tobago Cadet Corps. Like this thing, with the camp and so on and so on. And my mother, um, my godmother came down and so on. So she would take him up and I sent him to school and da 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 da. da, da, da. My father was all for it. And when my mother got back, she used to call my father Franklin. Franklin, you want this boy to go and join the army and get himself killed? He's not setting one foot out of this house. And that was the end of me and going to the United States. So when I told her about joining the Coast Guard, and the tears came, and she said, you're a big boy now, you could handle your own self, and da 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 da. So <clears throat> I got in the tongue, filled up the form, got the documents, jumped in a taxi, got down to St. James Post Office, for the Coast Guard collected its mail at the St. James Post Office. And just as I got there, the Coast Guard vehicle was just there. So I handed the guy the envelope, he put it in the bag, 
about four days later, I was called to come for an exam, and well, the rest is history. First of January, 1968, I was on a plane going to England. Never been on a plane before, never seen winter before, and boy, it was a rude awakening. By the 3rd of January, because that time was BYC, and you know you're going the long route, Bermuda and all this sort of stuff. 3rd of January, I'm on a train to a place called Dartmouth that I'd never heard of before. Got there with Foggy and so on, and a grizzly looking white chief, petty officer, Mr. Franklin, and he said, Follow me, and took me to this place. Met a set of other boys. I was the only one from the Western Hemisphere. The other in Talis and my intake were mainly from Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, Kenya, and um, there were a few. English cadets in that country. And we got on, they divided us up into six berth cabins. So the first night, the first day, we got our uniform and you had to polish, learn how to polish your boots. But um, an interesting thing they did, they gave us a chip for 300 cigarettes. So every month when you got paid, you got a chip for 300 cigarettes. I didn't smoke. My dad smoked heavily. So I decided, let me see what this thing is all about. So I got three, um, 30 packs of 10. And um, we all in the cabin lit up. And we all there polishing and exchanging the stories and getting to know you. But boy, coughing. Coffin, coffin. The room was thick with smoke. Next morning, I didn't like how my hands smelled. So I put on the cigarettes. I said, no, I can't take this. Um, so that was me and cigarettes. So I had my 300 cigarettes every month, and I used it for different things. I learned, I learned um, from the Nigerians and the Saudi Arabians what to do with it. Cigarettes became money. So for example, when I went on an expert, an expedition, and I came back, I was out in Dartmoor for two days. My boots were all muddy and, and so on, and too tired and so on. I clean anything. You just get into the shower and try and get into your bed. I left my boots down, down below in the cellar. Next morning, we had parade um, training. But I think the commanders there at the college knew every little trick cadets did because by 10 o'clock there was an old chief, we used to call him Noddy. He, was, uh, he retired, he was in his late 60s or 70s. Mr. Franklin, I found you in your boots and down below. I said, Oh, shucks, really? I said, Yes, you naughty young man, aren't you? Here's Apache. <laughs> and that was it. So he would always pass in the cabin and look out for us in the cabin, make sure your, your cabin, your drawer, that one drawer you were allowed to lock was properly locked, and the rest you had to leave it open, staggered for inspection and so on, and your bed with your counterpane and the anchor dead in the center and all this sort of thing. So I learned how to trade in cigarettes. My time at, at Dartmouth um, was, was the most interesting time. Like, I think any other cadet going abroad, we try to pick up as much as we can. I really had no sea experience. Some of the other guys, particularly the ones from Malaysia, had sea experience. But we had we had a, a, a regime that one, you got very fit very quickly because you ran everywhere. You went, you wanted double, going with your books and everything um, all day, and. Um, when late spring came, I walked up by the playing field and I saw fellas practicing cricket. So I was standing up there and the person in charge came to me and said, um, where are you from? I said, I'm from Trinidad. He said, you play cricket down there? I said, yes. He said, well, you want to play? I said, well, I don't have any whites or any boots. He said, boots? He said, you people wear boots down there? 
Well, that got me very annoyed. So I wrote a letter to my mom to send my boots for me, which, I mean, in, in hindsight, probably wasn't the best thing to do. I could have saved some money and buy boots. But my mom sent my full cricket gear for me. And um, I had a very good season. In fact, Dartmouth had an excellent season. It was the first time they won the Inter-Services tournament. I was able to capture against Sandhurst. I fell in top of that against Sandhurst. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I did four for nine against Sandhurst. And I'm pretty no Air Force personnel here. I got seven for 13 against Cromwell. So I was the toast of Dartmouth for quite a while. And anyway, I walked in the street when we went out there with people. And in fact, um, it was in, what year, 2004? I can't remember when we went, to, we went back to England. So I took my wife to see Dartmouth. And there was this young cadet taking us along. And he was able to show the photograph of the Dartmouth cricket team, frankly. <laughs> so I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. We went out to the squadron, enjoyed the Mediterranean. Interesting thing happened now, there while I, I was a duty cadet, you know. Um, in those days, the sailors drank grog. You know what grog is? Grog is rum and water, right? So lunchtime, there's grog, and mix the grog, and sailors come up from the mess decks with their um, jug for their, so that they could go and give the tots. Now you know what a tot is. People know what a tot is, right? A tot of rum. So that's where the expression comes from. So you had your little tots down in your mess there. So as the duty cadet, I would supervise the mixing of grub, so rum and water and ice. Well, I had a few. <laughs> but um, the thing is, they were quite surprised that, you know, this young cadet was not supposed to be drinking rum on the ship, but the sailor, you know, give me a thing. And then when I, as duty cadet, I had to be up in the bridge and I would make announcements. And um, so I would make my announcements. And it was, this something that struck me last night again. That it soon came to mind last night when I heard Justice Cross talk about it. After a while, the captain came up to the bridge to see who was making these announcements. He couldn't, he found the accent was most interesting and the pronunciation of words so crisp. So I had, I was in with the captain from, from then on in the squadron. And I, I got a fair amount of respect from the sailors generally, the British sailors on the road. So that when I went back to college, at the end of a um, sea time, sailing back up the river Dart and so on, and you're, you're deck there, you know, a senior cadet, you fell out, you are old salt. You've been to sea. You have spent three months out in the Mediterranean. I and mean, you come back in the college now, you don't run anywhere. You're a senior, you walk. So the youngsters looking at you in awe, oh, you know, and they want to get stories. So, but that crystallized, I mean, the, the year as a cadet was most, most fruitful. I was able to graduate with first class honors, which perhaps was, was something um, I don't think anybody in the Trinidad Coast Guard had done before. So I had a great time. Back to Trinidad now as a young midshipman. And then you meet all sorts of characters. That a fella called Gaylord Kelshall. <laughs> Boy, we had a captain, a commanding officer called Bloom. And um, Bloom insisted, well, first, my first job was um, captain secretary. At that time, I don't think it was still done. I was in the, what we call the executive branch, the seamen. It, it is, was envisaged that the young men in the executive branch would become the commanding officer, online for the commanding officer. So you are exposed to every department in the Coast Guard. My very first job was commanding officer secretary. And it, the reason why we put you there so that you can learn everything that's going on. You're reading all the correspondence. You get to understand how this place works, right? how the ministry works and so on. Then I spent time in engineering. I spent time in supply. I spent time in communications. 
then I spent some time in a thing called the Internal Security Platoon, commanded by Lieutenant Gaylord Kershaw. Well, who tell them do that? But, you know, there, I mean, I said that Coast Guard was a lot of adventure and so on. I think my time in the internal security platoon really started the adventure because we did a lot of things. I mean, I knew of the desire, the Lord's desire to do this kind of thing. He took me to his house and he showed me what he was doing, right? Um, we went on expeditions to look for stuff. He tried to teach me diving, but he failed miserably because I kept bouncing over the bottom of the, you know, the ocean. So he, but we did a lot. We um, had experts on, on Gaspar Grande. I could draw Gaspar Grande, you know, with my eyes closed, looking for all sorts of things. The time as, as a, a young officer in the internal security platoon, you really learn a lot about leadership of men. And this is before I really got to, all that time I had to be on board a ship as well. Eh? Patrols, 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 and there was no rest for the wicked midshipmen. Because when the boat is alongside, you're doing something else. When the boat is ready to go, you go whichever boat you are. Um, time was when I was coming back, I spent about eight days in Barbados, going back to a patrol to Barbados and coming back. I really needed a rest. And the other vessel was going out on a four-day patrol. And the two ships ran this one. Franklin, over. So I had to take my bag, I step over on the other ship, and I'm gone again. And this is what, well, it was the, the curse of being the only midshipman in the place, but it was also the blessing of being the only midshipman because you got all the experiences thrown at you. Everything. Everything was thrown. I would even tell you that they tried with flying. Well, he tried a little bit, and Archibald tried with flying. But really, I had no interest in flying. So, having joined the Coast Guard on 1st of January, 68, then back here in 69 as a midshipman and doing all the things, up comes 1970. On the afternoon of 